How does God deal with a world in chaos? We see a United States of Europe developing now. We see everything in Bible prophecy coming to critical mass. And you look around and, and you see the gay agenda. You, you see and hear things that 20 years ago you couldn't believe possible. And we see this race toward destruction. Then you go into church history and you see God's plan. God didn't send angels. He touched men. He touched women. Ordinary people. Now you can abort the call of God like Saul did. I'm going to give you an everlasting kingdom. And you can abort that by getting into the flesh and, and getting away from God's plan and the touch of God. He's certainly a man who was filled with the Holy Spirit and touched, and he aborted that. And God said, you want my hand on you? You want to be touched? Then you get on your face. And that's the first call you receive if you're going to be touched by God. God will call you to the mountain to pray. God said, David, you better give me the prayer and seek my face. And there was something came on me. There has to come this sense of I can't live like this. And I've told our people in Times Square Church, if I'm going to be a man of God and your kids are going to get to heaven. They're not going to go to hell under our watch. I have to be alone with God. I have to be a man of prayer. I'm, I'm not here just to fellowship with you. I'm not here to have supper with you or play ball games with you. I'm here to come to the pulpit from the throne room of God. So your kids are convicted of their sins. And every friend that you bring to this church will come under the conviction of the Holy Ghost and get saved. The Bible said the Lord came down on Mount Sinai at the top of the mountain. The Lord called Moses up to the top of the mountain, being shut in with God. And the Bible said that Moses went up. And the people stood afar off. Moses drew near to the Lord. And I began to draw near to the Lord. Now, Moses is a busy man at this time. How would you like to have the biggest congregation in the world? In all of history. But see, he was not the only one called. God said, I want you to bring your brother with you. I want you to bring Aaron. I want you to bring his sons, Nadab and Abihu. And I want you to bring the 70 elders. And they go halfway up the mountain, and I call that halfway camp. They were called to come up with Moses to be alone with God. Now, God knew what was in their hearts. These are all ministers of the Lord. Aaron is going to go to the tabernacle that had been built yet, but see, God knows that he's going to have to go into the Holy of Holies, and he knows he's going to have to be a pure man. You're going to know something of my presence. Very few men know I'm going to use you in a way you can't conceive, but I can't use you with what is in your heart now. So he calls them halfway up the mountain. He calls Nadab and Abihu because these are his priests. And he knows that they're committing adultery and fornication. And he knows what's in their heart. But he, he's still patient and he loves these men. He knows that 70 elders are not under authority because these are the same elders that later are going to rebel and say, you're not the only holy one. We're just as holy as you are. And God calls these men like he's calling us today. He calls us halfway up the mountain and suddenly God appears and he seats them and he feasts with them. How would you like to be present at the utter holiness of Almighty God? How would you like to see a God of such mercy who loved you so much? He came from heaven literally and sat with you and minister to you. I'm going to bring you now into my presence. Moses alone shall come near. Lord, they shall not come near. Neither shall the people go up with him. Why couldn't they go to the top of the mountain? Why couldn't they go to the glory cloud? They never go back to their horrible sin. And there's Aaron who goes back to the golden calf. Only Moses goes up to the top of the mountain. God called you to pray. Pastor, if you're not going to pray, I suggest getting a secular job. And because of their sin, because of the fornication, the adultery, and because of the, they were worshiping their little gods, Rempha, and the other little gold mice they brought out of, out of Egypt. They'd hidden them in their tents, and now this broke out in the camp. And the glory departed. The glory absolutely departed from the camp. 
And Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it outside the camp, afar off from the camp. It came to pass that every one which sought the Lord went out to the tabernacle of the congregation. You've got to come to the mountain. You begin to seek me with all your heart. You give me time. My wife knows when I go into my secret place, no one, no one can get through, even if the president calls and his office did call. And the answer is always the same. He's talking to the Father. There should be no one able to interrupt you or intercept you. Came to pass as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of his tent. And the Lord talked with Moses. You see, the Lord takes the pillar, the cloud in his presence, and he moves it over top of Moses' tent. Here's a man without defilement. Here's a man who seeks God's face. Here's a man with no other plan but to go to God and seek him for direction and plead for his people. And the glory of the Lord, the presence of God comes on top of his tent. With one man that's been shut in with God. One man out of the place of defilement. Know you not that you're the temple of God? The Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy. Which temple you are. Could you tell me of any other day in your history, in your time, do you know of any other time when God so needs men that are touched, men that are shut in with God? Lord, I want you to bring everything under control of the Holy Spirit. And being not weak in faith, he, he considered not his own body, now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. Let me ask you a question. Did God make you a promise? All those who walk righteously before God, all those who know him as Lord and Savior, he speaks to. He gives promises. He talks about the future. God spoke to you. He gave you a promise and it has been delayed, and it has been delayed, and the question arises, oh God, did I hear you right? I thought I heard from you. I see no evidence of happening. This brings me to the point, to the heart of my message. Now listen closely, and if you hear this in the Spirit, it'll change your life. It'll bring an understanding to you about the ways of the Lord. The Holy Spirit sent this to me, just been working it for about two weeks into my very being and all the blessed hope that is given to me. Now let's consider, first of all, Abraham. That great marvelous promise God gave to him, I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and I'll make thy name great. He's 75 at the time. His wife is 10 years younger. She's 65, and her womb is not shut. Now, this sounds like a very doable promise, because he was still able to bear. He was not dead. It's very doable. It's a wonderful promise and it didn't happen and a year goes by and two years go by and three years go by and the years go by and what does God do he puts a sentence of death on that promise he's a hundred years old and his wife is 90 and the Lord comes back to him and says you're going to have a child he says too late Lord to the human mind it was too late it's all over all oh, the beloved God was not late God was right on time, and he's never one minute late on his promises. He knows exactly when to fulfill it. Consider Joseph with me, if you will, please. What a great and very special promise is given to this man. This Bible said his sheep should be higher than all the other sheep. Of all the sheep of his brethren, so they shall all bow down to thine. The sun and the moon will bow down before you, your father and your mother. But before it was fulfilled, what did God do? He sentenced me the promise to death and all the possibilities of ever being fulfilled. He is sold as a slave into Egypt. He is imprisoned. He is forgotten. He knows nobody. He doesn't know the language. And finally, the vision is dead. The vision is gone. There's no hope. 
he suddenly realizes after a short conversation that these are his brothers and they're all kneeling before him. And suddenly the lights go on. The promise. The promise. He's not dead. God sent me here to save them. He sends for his mother and father and they come bowing before him. And Joseph later reveals, he said, this was the working of God. God sent me here to save a posterity. One day, unexpectedly, suddenly it happens. <laughs> Samuel was told, go anoint David. He takes David aside. He takes the cruise of oil, pours it over his head, prophesies over it. The Spirit of God comes on that young man. What an incredible promise to give a young man just out of his teens that he's going to be the king of Israel. What a promise. But what does God do with that promise? He sentences it to death in every conceivable way that it can be fulfilled. You find David next hiding in caves. You see Saul chasing him like a, like a hunted animal. He, he is chased. He is reproached. He is mocked. He is ridiculed. He's persecuted. He's lost his family. He's lost everything. His house is burning. He stands there. His co-workers wanting to stone him. And you go up to him and say, David, what about that promise? I'm a fugitive. I'm not a king. There's no possible way. All the possible ways that it could be fulfilled for God. But did God make a mistake? Was the promise dead? Did God keep his word to David? Did David ever sit on the king, the king's throne? Hallelujah. But first death was rolled in to make it appear dead so that God would be all the more glorified when it happened. The word redemption means brought out of death. This is how God works all the time. He brings joy out of sorrow. He redeems peace out of conflict. He redeems beauty out of ashes. He redeems health out of disease. He redeems liberty out of captivity, assurance out of doubt and unbelief. Now God takes us the way of death that we may learn to trust him alone. The scripture says, but we have the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raises the dead. You have to get out into the deeper waters before you cast yourself and commit yourself to either sink or swim. And that's what's happening to many of us. We always touch and bottom. We want something to fall back on. We're afraid to swim out into faith and believe his promises. The prophet Habakkuk was absolutely uh, stunned. The Lord had given him a revelation of a revival. He said, when I heard it, my belly trembled. My lips quivered at the voice. Rockness entered into my bones and I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. But suddenly he stands up in faith because God is showing him something. The prophet stands up in, in the middle of all this. He says, I'm not going to look on the circumstance. I'm not going to look at what I see with my eyes. I know what God said. And then he says this, although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines. The labor of the vine shall fail. The field shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold and there shall be no herb in the stall. Nevertheless, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like hinds feet, and he will make me to walk upon my high places. Praise God. I've heard a word from the Lord. I don't care what it says. I don't care how dark it is. Revival's coming. And the Lord says, I know what you're going to face. I know you're going to face rejection. I know you're going to face misunderstanding. I know that people are going to turn you. Even family will turn on you. I know you're going to go through doubt and fear. The boat's going to shake, but I give you an anchor. God gives us a promise that he intends to be an anchor of hope to hold us through every single storm we go through. If you're living in sin, if you're living in bitterness, if, you live, if, if God told you to obey him certain things and you're not doing it, don't wait for that promise to come past. Get into obedience. Obey God. Folks, the promise I'm talking about comes to those who truly know his heart. You're walking with him. Folks, the only ones that can believe God for promises are those who say, not my will, Lord, but thine. We need a whole army of troublemakers to become so full of the Holy Ghost 
they'll stir and shake New York City. They caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace under the rulers and brought them to the magistrates, saying, these men being Jews to exceedingly trouble our city. Troublemakers. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates ran or tore off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them and cast them into prison, they charged the jailer to keep them there safely. The Lord's having his time. The devil had his day, but you always just say, wait and see. Uh, one of my favorite expressions goes, we'll see. We will see. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang. Praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them, and suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's bands were loose. Brother, sister, the devil can rage. The powers that be may threaten you, but God, in the final analysis, has all the power. God will stand by you if you take your stand for Christ. But you know, just going and praying alone is not enough. Praying with two or three is not enough. Praying corporately with a whole a group on Tuesday or Friday night, that's not enough. Going to large prayer meetings, that in itself will not shake up cities. Now, Elijah has been used by the scripture as an example of what prayer is all about. But it was not just his prayer time that shook the kingdom of Ahab and enraged Jezebel. No, he came out of his prayer chamber in the wilderness and he stood again the whole kingdom of Ahab and he wants you to gather every prophet of Baal. Meet me up on Mount Carmel. The God who answers by fire is the God of Israel. We're going to see who has power. We're going to see who has the might and the majesty. Now the churches of late in New York City and the United States have cowered before the devil. They've cowered before the principalities and powers of drugs and alcohol and pornography and every other principality of Satan. The church has seemed powerless. But my Bible said the righteous are as bold as a lion. And the reason there's been a cowardice against the things of this world, against drug abuse, against alcoholism, against all of these things that are happening in the wicked city of New York, is because there had not been a spirit of righteousness that would bring forth the boldness of Jesus Christ. When he took the whip and went into the temple and drove out the money changers, when he looked against the Pharisees and called them snakes and vipers, he was not a meek, lowly Jesus. When he called them the sons of the devil, he said, Your father is the devil. New York City churches are full of silent, gentlemanly diplomats. Nobody wants to make trouble. So the devil's kingdom goes unchallenged. I'm trying to wake up Christians here in the Times Square Church to believe in the power of Christ and his resurrection. I'm going to talk to you about how the apostolic church of Jesus Christ in the first church age challenged the powers of darkness. Paul and Silas challenged a dead, corrupt religious church system. Jesus, who might preach unto you, is Christ. Now, they had already stirred Philippi, and now they moved to Thessalonica. And Paul has a habit. He goes right in among them. He goes right to the seat of it. He doesn't hide. He doesn't go in and say, well, go pray for them. I'm going into the den. Preaching on the kingship of Jesus, Paul turned that synagogue inside out and the whole air Thessalonica upside down. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas and of the devout Greeks, a great multitude, and of the chief women, not a few. But the Jews, which believed not, moved with envy, took upon them, took unto themselves certain lewd, a wicked fellows, men of a baser sort, and gathered a company and set all the city on an uproar. These men have turned the world upside down and they've come here to our town. We were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi. Yet we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. This was the house of God. This was the synagogue. This was the church. And why are they so enraged? The same kind of anger they got at Philippi. What's going on here? Paul, when he preached the kingship of Christ, he was saying, you lay down your idols. You give up the places of sin. Paul preached self-denial. He preached suffering for the glory of Christ, even to martyrdom. 
He said you will no longer follow men or teachers or doctrines of man. You're not going to be led around by merchandisers who make merchandise out of you. He said you're going to live a life of holiness, separation from the very appearance of evil. You have no fellowship with evil, with wicked men. You have no fellowship whatsoever. He preached separation, holiness, righteousness as the Lordship and Kingship of Jesus. He just didn't get up there and say, Christ is Lord. The moment you really begin to come under the kingship of Christ and live it, you are not living like you used to. You are not indulging like you used to. There's a change and everybody knows it. That, folks, is when you're going to shake up people. You're going to get more people angry at you than any time in your life. You know why Christians don't witness for Christ on the job? It's because their hearts are not stirred in them like Paul's was. Because all around them there are people given to idolatry. The Bible said we're all ambassadors for Jesus Christ. You look at the idolatry of New York City. You look at the gluttony. You look at the hell. You look at the devil taking over the city. And your heart breaks. Paul looked at that city and said nobody's challenging. There were no church. There were no Christians. He was alone. And Paul said if I don't challenge the devil here, these people are going to die and go to hell. And when you go to the job, that's what God has to put in your heart. If I don't tell them, they're going to die and go to hell. Now, Paul had visited many cities. He'd seen it all. He'd seen the drunkenness at Corinth. He'd seen the homosexual spirit that ruled Rome. He'd seen the spiritual darkness of Jerusalem. He never let his heart get hard. Never once did Paul's heart get hard. He was not overwhelmed by what Satan did to this city because Paul knew he had a secret weapon. He had the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. One man against the whole city. One man. He had a message. He said, I, I serve a Christ who is greater than everything that the devil has done to this city. I have a resurrection spirit in me of Jesus Christ. The watchman must lift up his voice. Everybody in this church should have a Philip ministry. A Philip ministry. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and he preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. This is not Paul the Apostle, now this is Philip the layman. For unclean spirits crying with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them and were taken with them. Many were taken with palsies and those who were lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. We will never impact this city until you realize that once you've been saved and filled with the Spirit of the living God, you've been endued with power from on high, and you're to go out and lay hands on the sick, you're to go out and pray that devils will be cast out, and you're to be an evangelist on the job. You've been called to a Philip ministry. All power is given unto me. Go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel. There's a spiritual battle now for your mind and your soul. Paul talks about the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Weapons of war, our war, it says, our war. We come to the strategy now of Satan coming against entire congregations. He comes against the laity. He comes against the church body. He comes against whole congregations. He attacked the Corinthian church with a flood of lust and carnality. He comes to the Galatian church with a bewitching spirit. Ephesus, he attacks the church. He attacks the love and devotion to Christ. At Smyrna, Satan cast some of them in prison. He sent blasphemers into their midst. At Pergamos, false doctrine was sent to leaven the church. At Thyatira, the devil sent teachers in with the Jezebel spirit to seduce the congregations into fornication. And when you come to Sardis, you find formality and deadness cast upon them. And at Laodicea, the spirit of lukewarmness, covetousness, materialism blinded the whole congregation. You see, he's going after the laity, he's going after the congregation, he's going after the masses of believers. And I'm saying now that in this last day, in this short period of time, the devil with such wrath knows he has to change his strategy. 
And the strategy is this. I'm going after the leaders. I'm going to focus all my attention on everyone who has spiritual authority. Everyone who walks close to Christ. Every prayer warrior. I'm going after their very faith. I'm going after their homes, their marriages. I'm going to try to paralyze every spiritual man and woman on the face of the earth. That had rule over the chariot saying, fight neither with small nor great, save only with the king of Israel. He said, we get him, they're all going to flee. And all that's happening to the church of Jesus Christ today. Pastors, missionaries, Christian leaders, deacons, elders falling left and right. Spiritual authority being robbed. And now you see the devil's laid his hands on every invention of man to use in this battle. The devil owns the internet. He owns it. He owns the film industry. But he owns television now. He owns commercial television. He owns network television. In the eyes of God, marked for righteousness and marked for usefulness. In the devil's eye, marked for this final attack. Is that you have set your heart on Christ. You seek him with all your heart, mind, and soul, and spirit. You've turned from the things of this world. And, and you have laid a hold of something that you won't let go, and the devil knows it. And you're a testimony of the righteousness of Christ in this dark, wicked age. If you're a praying man or woman, believing, trusting God, living in his righteousness by faith, you are marked. Now, in the King James, it said, dead flies in the ointment. But in the original Hebrew, it says, flies of death cause the ointment of the pocket theory to send forth a stinking savor, smell. So doth the little folly, him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. You see, the devil's plan is to put this fly of death, just a touch of flesh, a touch of the world. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for their foolishness to him. Neither can he know them because they're spiritually deserved. The spiritual man knows the mind of Christ. He's full of the Holy Ghost. No part dark, no flies of death in him. He's got spiritual wisdom. He has revelation from God. He has an open heaven. The Corinthians had moved out of the spiritual realm into the natural realm. And that's what's happening to the church of Jesus Christ today. You sit in front of a television and you drink and drink and drink. And I'm telling you, slipping hour by hour into the natural man that can no longer comprehend the things of God because you lose your discernment. Be not unequally yoked with unbelievers. Come out from among them. Be separate and clean. Touch not the unclean thing. And that word of Paul was so anointed of the Holy Spirit. There was a demonstration. Life change is the demonstration. People walking out of the house of God with a message they can't shake out of their head or out of their heart. And they have to act on it. Because the Holy Spirit keeps moving them in the direction of the word they've received. You show me a church of... 10,000, 25,000 people, masses coming. And those who come to church, if they're not a preaching of repentance, if they're not changing, they're, they're all natural people. They're carnal. They're still living in sin because there's no message and there's no conviction and no Holy Ghost moving in the church. And if the man in the pulpit is just a man of ambition, if he too is in the natural and he is in the flesh, then I'm going to tell you that a whole congregation could go to hell. There's no message from heaven that pierces the wall. And I'm convinced as many people are going to hell in the church than anywhere else in society. Going to hell right in church because natural men are speaking to natural men and they don't understand. And that's why Satan's going after every spiritual elder, deacon, Sunday school teacher, anyone in any kind of ministry, choir, going after with everything out of hell. And I'm telling you, folks, there's never been a time when you have been more tested than you are now. In Isaiah 9, 7, says, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it, to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform it. There has to be an increase. We increase in obedience and submission, subjection to all that the Word of God speaks to us until this nothing 
Nothing is believed. Nothing is done. Everything is judged by the word of the Lord. Are you under the government of the Holy Spirit? This is how I believe God is going to protect his leadership. He's going to protect all of those who are in the spiritual man. He's going to build up a spiritual immunity because the government of Jesus Christ is going to increase more and more. He's going to have a body who are more and more subjected to the Holy Ghost, who cry out for that direction, who submit themselves in prayer and to the word of God. And they begin to judge their sins righteously. We're to judge righteous judgment. The moment you judge your sin and say, I'm not going to lose my anointing. I'm not going to have a fly in my ointment. I'm not going to let the devil rob me of my effectiveness. When that happens, the Holy Ghost comes and flits away the power of hell in your life. It's done. It's finished. He empowers you with his glorious power. That's the demonstration of the Holy Ghost and power. My people are bent in backsliding from me. That's a, a habit with my people. That's the habit of all of Israel. You read the history and the story of Israel, one generation after another backsliding. Turn back, Israel. Turn back to the Lord, O oh backsliding Israel, for the Lord is married to you. You find this term all through the Bible, backsliding, turning back on God. God's people mostly backslide in times of prosperity and blessing. When God is blessing you, you've got his favor, that's the time to beware. That's the time that backsliding usually comes to God's people. The backslider, whether it's a he or she, is that child of God who has enjoyed the blessing and favor of the Lord, someone who's walked with God, devoted, loved the word of God, loved to pray, walked in holiness, gentle, kind perhaps, but now something has drawn the heart away. There's no more genuine love. The heart has grown cold in love toward the Lord. They no longer seek Him. They no longer go to His Word. Prayer is gone. They become foolish. They're without understanding. Their conversation changes. They don't talk the way they used to talk. There's a hard time getting them into the house of God. They don't testify of the love of Jesus to their friends or their co-workers anymore. They have grown cold and backslidden from the Lord. Bible says it's a very evil and bitter thing to backslide against the Lord. Their own wickedness shall correct them. Their backsliding shall reprove them. Know therefore and see that it's an evil thing and a bitter thing that you have forsaken the Lord your God and that his fear is no longer in you, saith the Lord of hosts. It's a terrible thing to try to sleep at night when you know you're running from God. And you remember being in the house of God. You remember being in meetings just like this. And here you are now trying to go to bed at night because you have compromised and you have turned your back and you're running away from the Lord. There's no rest to the wicked. There's no rest. Oh, there are a lot of people that have that deep sleep upon them. He's going to send a storm into your life and get you back. When you backslide, you become one of the most dangerous persons on earth. It's not just your problem. It's the problem of everybody that lives with you, walks with you, and knows you. You are a dangerous person because God's after you. You see, when you backslide, you don't only affect yourself, you affect the whole family because God sends storms. Backslidden Christians are sending a lot of people to hell on their jobs. You're going to be rebuked by the world. The world's going to stand up and rebuke you. This captain comes to Jonah fast asleep and he shakes him. You know what he said? What meanest thou, O sleeper? Rise and call upon God. A heathen captain commanding a preacher to get on his face. Get down and pray, preacher. You know, Paul, the apostle, he was on his boat that was tossed in a horrible hurricane. But he went running from God. And that man could stand before all the devils of hell. And he could stand on that rocking boat and say, don't worry, gentlemen, not one of you is going to be lost. I heard from God last night. My Lord told me we're all going to be saved. 
Jonah had no power whatsoever. He couldn't command the storm. He couldn't bring hope. He had no message. He had nothing. He was weak. He was a coward. And that's what sin does to you. It takes away your dignity. It takes away your strength. It takes away your power and makes you a coward before all mankind. God is going to take you down into the lowest pit known to man. You are going to be tossed and turned inside out, upside down. No one can escape this storm because God has a purpose. He's after you. Not to hurt you, not to kill you, but to deliver you and bring you back to his first love. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. After the storm comes the most critical, dark moment of your life. That's called the pit of despondency and despair. In this stinking mess of darkness and everything else, folks, that's a picture, backslider, of where you're headed. There's only two options. One, you give up to despondency. You say, well, well, God had a mission for him. No, God can find somebody else. God can find somebody else. Because we have our own free will. You can die in despondency. You can allow yourself to wallow in that fear and wallow in that guilt and condemnation and fear and you can die in it and go to hell. Or you can say, no, I've heard a message tonight, a message of hope, a message of strength and power in Jesus. I can come home. I can come back. When Jonah began to pray in the belly of the well, and I believe he had a revival meeting there. God moved on that well and swooshed him across the Mediterranean, got him up into the high places and took him out, landed that well near the shore and made him vomit. Out came a man of God, free, set free, anointed, back on schedule with the anointing of the Holy Ghost. God restored everything that was destroyed and eaten. God restored it. God wants to restore everything the devil has taken from you. He wants to give everything back to you in good measure. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, if thou return, then will I bring thee again, and thou shalt stand before me. And if thou take forth the precious from the vow, thou shalt be my mouth. Let them return unto thee, but return not unto them. And I will make thee unto this people a fenced brazen wall. They shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee. For I am with thee to save thee, and to deliver thee, saith the Lord, and I will deliver thee out of the hand of the wicked and will redeem thee out of the hand of the terrible. I will pull you out of the belly's well and I'll set you free. Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up from the land of Egypt. You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for your iniquities. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Will a lion roar in the forest when he has no prey? Will a young lion cry out of his den if he has not taken nothing? Can a bird fall into a snare upon the earth where no net or gin is for him? Shall one take up a snare from the earth and have taken nothing at all? Trumpet be blown in the city and the people not be afraid. Shall there be evil in the city and the Lord hath not done it? Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret to his servant, the prophets. The lion hath roared, who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken, who can but prophesy? This is a word against the whole family. To those God has placed his hand upon, those which he has delivered. He's speaking to his own people here. I have done a work in you, and I have chosen you, and I have blessed you. You're my family. I'm going to deal with you unlike I would deal with anyone else, because whom I love I chasten. This is a sign of my love. Therefore, I will correct you for iniquity. Two cannot walk together unless they are agreed. I not walk with you, not do with you what I want to do with you, unless we are one, unless we're walking in agreement. The controversy God has with the evangelical church of Sweden is one word, one issue, apathy.
He said, I can't walk with you in spite of the call for revival, in spite of all of it. He said, I see in my church those who are my family. Look to the cults and look to dead formal churches and say to them with a pointed finger, you have a form of godliness without power because of apathy. Satisfied now to come to the house of God. Go through the motions and the programs organized to try to find power and authority with society. And you become tolerant. And the word that God hears from the lips of the government and the lips from the church is, we are a tolerant people. No, he said, you're a lukewarm people. You tolerate your government to tell you you can't speak against homosexuality from your pulpit. And no one is falling on their knees and using the weapon of prayer to bring down those strongholds. No tears there and no anguish. The lion is roaring in Sweden. This is the roaring lion out of hell. He is roaring as he has never roared in this nation in history. The lion only roars when he has a victim. And he has a prey and drags him to his nest. And looking at that dead prey before he devours, he roars in victory. The devil is roaring because he's come against the church of Jesus Christ. I had mighty leaders among you, men with fire in their bones and under their ministry. I raised up prophets, young men who were Nazarites, were separated from this world, fiery young Nazarites. Young prophets want to set a whole nation on fire. My hand was upon them. I was in this pulpit in the early 70s, right here where I stand. And I saw hundreds of young people burning on fire. I saw holy prophets of God. I heard a sound, a glorious sound. God was raising up a new generation. God's plan for this very day, that these prophets would now be going through your nation. These separated young people would be bringing the message to thousands of young people. They'd be traveling the world right now, bringing millions to repentance. But a spirit of apathy fell, cry for prosperity. And now the cry was a good job, no self-denial, but to get the comfortable house. And we had television introduced into our homes and all the gadgets to bring the whole world into our living rooms. So we let that generation sit in front of television and saturate their minds with filth. Turn prophets into puppets of the enemy. You want to cry and weep? You don't want to spend two hours in prayer meeting. Now it's hours in television. And go to the house of God with no burden of the Lord. You didn't want the Nazarite life for your children. And you've given the wine of prosperity. Don't disturb us. No weeping prophets among us. Give us smooth words. The fields are white to harvest. There's a hungry generation out there ready to turn to Christ. Folks, we've lost a whole generation. Mothers that used to weep for their children, now laughing in front of the television set. Therefore the flight shall perish from the swift, and the strong shall not strengthen his force, neither shall the mighty deliver himself. Do you understand what the prophet is saying? He said, if you don't wake up, church, if you don't deal with this, if you will not come back to a broken heart and a contrite spirit, then it will grow weaker and weaker. Your young people who were once strong will grow weak. They will flee from the house of God. And without a spirit of anguish of heart, you will see nothing but weakness, spiritual nakedness, and no armor against the powers of hell. They come to Nehemiah. Hanani, his brother, comes. He said, Jerusalem is in ruins. The walls are down. Everybody's out for themselves. And Scripture says, there's great affliction and reproach on the church. The walls of Jerusalem also are broken down and the gates are burned with fire. How did God revive Jerusalem? How did he build up the walls and the temple? Did God do a new thing in the land? When I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Verse 6, let now your ear be attentive and thy eyes open that you may hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before you night and day for the children of Israel, thy servants. Confess the sins of the children of Israel which we have sinned against thee, both I and my father's house have sinned. The antidote for apathy is anguish. You come to Times Square Church Tuesday night when we pray and intercede. Church is packed and people in the overflow room, anguishing, crying out to God. When terrorists struck New York City and brought the towers down, that happened on the ninth month, the 11th day. Here's what I've been told to tell you. 
for the church of Jesus Christ. This is your spiritual 9-11. It's a call. It's a wake up. Now the devil's roaring. The only way it can be awakened. But young man, there has to be something in you. Saying, I'm willing to sacrifice. Deny myself. For Take up a call. God, break me. Bring me into that Nazarite life. Let me be one who's awakened. Let me be one who seeks your face. Call your people to prayer. Get on your face before God. You have spoken to us. You've given us our awakening call. You've blown the trumpet. And we will not let the devil roar. Our weapons are mighty through God. To pull down to the stronghold of Satan. The church of Jesus Christ, wake up. Take authority over the powers. But oh God said he's defeated. Take your authority over the power of the lion. Oh lion of Judah. Rise up and protect your name. And meet us once again. Do it again. That's your spirit. In this particular letter, written to the pastor of the Church of Philadelphia, God is speaking about opening doors and closing doors. And this pastor was facing an issue. Evidently, he was facing doors that were closing on him. Everything he tried, everywhere he went, the door was closed. And he was in a dilemma. You've prayed that God would answer, and nothing has happened. And you're here tonight facing a closed door. God says, I know your heart. I know your love for me. He said, there's something you've got to know. You can't push the door open. No one else can open the door for you. You can't work it open. You can't connive it open. I'm the only one that opens doors and closes. I counseled with the pastor this past week. He is so discouraged. He said, I'm leaving the ministry. He said, God doesn't answer my prayer. And I think that's the reason a lot of people stop praying. A great prophet told me. His name was Leonard Ravenhill. He wrote many books. He took me aside one day. He said, David, preachers don't pray. They start out praying, but then they just go on and do it on their own talent. And then finally the doors start closing. I never forgot that. I believe this. The only ministry that God approved is that which is born in the secret closet of prayer. I was told by some people who were part of a great church. They were talking about this wonderful pastor. He said he is so talented. He could do this without the Holy Spirit. He has that much talent. I don't care how big the church is. I don't care how beautiful it is. If it's not born in prayer, if it doesn't move in prayer, God doesn't approve it. If it's done in the flesh, if it's built on talent, one day it will shake and one day it will fall. The Holy Spirit came on me. He said, remember what your father taught you? My father was a powerful preacher. He said, David, God always makes a way for a praying man. You may not afford an education, but God will open doors. You become a man of prayer. No door will close. And one day, I went to my prayer room. God said, if you'll pray, instead of watching that television, I'm going to use you. I'm going to change. I got my Bible. And for months, I went out in the wood by myself, and I read the Word. I devoured the Word. I said, Jesus, I want to know your heart. I want a true Pentecost. And I began to cry out to him. You see, when you set your heart to seek God, and he sees that. The Holy Ghost comes, and he begins to draw you, pulls you. He melts you. And now you're praying. Not to ask for something, but to get to know him. Until nothing else matters, the call of God, wherever it may be, and to know his heart. And there was a picture of seven boys indicted for murder. And I began to cry. And the Holy Spirit whispered, this is what it's all about. I'm going to open the door. Go to New York City. Try to reach them. Go to the court and try to minister. That was the beginning of a ministry to gang. All true ministry every open door comes out and birthed out of prayer if the man in the pulpit the man who heads this if he's not seeking God he may have failed God but he has a repentant heart he has a broken heart he has no ego he's not trying to keep up with somebody he's not competing with somebody he's willing to take the lowest seat in the house and what his real concern is to give the full gospel a complete gospel 
including the message of heaven and hell, the preaching of the cross of Jesus Christ. And if the cross of Christ, with all of its sacrifice, all of its conviction for sin, all of its merit and everything the cross represents, if the cross, the blood, is not held before the people, God shuts the door. I'm telling you that I see more and more church and pastors compromising. They don't want to offend anybody. They want to preach a smooth, soft talk. They don't want to offend people that would leave the congregation. God answered prayer, and he opened a door. He opened a door to the most beautiful theater in New York City. And for 20 years, Times Square Church has been blessed. with People coming to the altars and nearly ever serving. God has answered the cry of my heart. Lord, one more time, before I go home, draw me back to the closet. Don't let me drift away. I see your church drifting. There's so many people preaching just a happy gospel. I hear nothing about the judgment that's coming. I don't hear prophetic voices. I see no people weeping. Oh, God, once again, one more time in these wicked days, come on me. Your spirit, make me a man, make me a woman of prayer. I want to start it tonight. Now come, Holy Spirit, with the love of God, draw us, forgive us for neglecting you, for looking elsewhere. Forgive your church. Turn our hearts. Change us. Do something supernatural. That's the only hope. And I know what the devil would like to do. Get you so busy and so burdened with the care of those you love. And the devil would love to draw you away from the power and the anointing that caused the Lord to put you in place. Draw me back to your heart. Draw me close. Lord, you're coming soon. Now is the time. Renew our heart. Touch me tonight. Come, Holy Spirit. Heal our sisters. Heal their bodies. Heal their spirit. Encourage their hearts. God is still with them. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. If there be, therefore, any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, any fellowship of the Spirit, bowels of mercy, fulfill you my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man to his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He said the mind that is in Christ, his thinking, his mindset is to be yours. Now, Jesus had a mindset. When I talk about the mind of Christ, I'm talking about a decision that a man or woman makes, a man or woman of God makes. It's not just thinking. It's how that thinking changes our lives and how we determine to live our lives. Jesus made a covenant with his father in eternity before he came as man. He made a covenant agreement that he would come as a servant. That he would lay down his glory. He would become a man. He would come to minister and not to be ministered to. And he would come as a humble servant. And that means saying, I come to do your will. I laid down my will. And this was determined in Psalms. You'll find that word of Christ to his father in eternity before the world was created, before man was born. I will go and delight to do your will. In the father's agreement with the son, if you will go and do my will, you will always know what that will is. It will never be hidden from you. You will know what I'm doing and how I'm doing it. And this will be, you will have my mind. You will have the mind of the father. You will have this glorified mindset. And when the apostle said, let this mind be in you as is when Christ Jesus, he's talking about the decision you make. When you come face to face with the word of God, come face to face with the mind of the heavenly father. You make a decision. This is how I'm going to live my life. I'm going to lay down my will. I'm not going to live according to my flesh. I'm not going to live like the world lives. I'm not going to live to the pleasures and lust of my heart. 
And there are a lot of people who name the name of Jesus, claim to be his disciple, but have never made a decision to live as he lived. They live with their tempers. They live with their character flaws, not wanting to change and say, well, that's the way I am. That's my nature. I want to be like Jesus. I want men and women to see Christ in me, beginning in my home and my family and in the church of Jesus Christ and those with I work with. I want them to know that I am different. And I'm doing this not to appear different. I'm doing this because of the love I have for my Christ. I want the sweetness and the meekness and the tender love of Jesus Christ as revealed in the scripture. Now, where did this man called Saul, who was a persecutor of the church of Jesus Christ, how could such an unworthy killer at heart come upon the mind of Christ? He said, I really believe that what I was doing was scriptural. I believed it was for God's glory. But I miss Christ. And when you miss Christ, everything you do is flesh. I have one goal in life, and that's to win Christ. That he would live his life through me and in me. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus And I know no other way to get the mind of Christ until you're emptied, until there's an emptying. And this is what Christ was doing with Paul, with Saul, three days of emptying himself so that he could be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Bible said Uzziah sought God in the days of Zechariah. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. Now, that's my prosperity message. He said, we sought him and he has given us rest on every side. All of Judah sought the Lord with all their hearts, and he was found of them, and the Lord gave them rest on all sides. Do you want to be like Jesus? Do you really want to be like Christ in your life? You want the mind of Christ, then you will be of no reputation, and you will be a servant to Christ and his church and to his body. I believe That if the light comes and God does something in this city, it's not going to come just from the pulpits. It's going to come from a body of loving, caring people. And everybody looks and says, what a caring people. I will seek your face. God, make this more of a praying church than it's ever been. And let the love of Christ Cause us to embrace every hurting person. Holy Spirit, will you draw us now? This is the great joy of your heart, Holy Spirit. This is your joy. This is what you've been called to do. This is what you've been sent to do. To bring us to every word that Christ ever spoke. And to reveal Jesus. And to show us things to come. Lord, do that for this people. Draw us now with cords of love. Paul was one of the most faithful servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he had three motivations behind that faithfulness. He had hope of eternal life. He had love for Jesus, but he had a third motivation for his faithfulness. And that was this fear of God, this reverential fear, because he knew that he would stand before the judgment seat of the Lord Jesus Christ. But what is missing in the church of Jesus Christ in these last days is that third motivation, that reverential fear, that awesome sense that I will stand one day and give an account of every motive, every deed, every thought, everything I've done and said, I've got to answer. I've got to stand before a holy God. Beloved, we're very soon going to stand before the judge of the universe, before his throne. It is appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. Paul said, for we must all appear. We shall appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Now, a day is soon coming when every person who's ever been born on the face of the earth, from Adam on, will be called out of their graves to stand 
before him, the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich, the chief captains, the mighty men, every bondman, every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him or from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity. And these reapers are going to go out at the command of the Lord Jesus and say it's judgment day. Bring them to the judgment. What a day of terror that's going to be. There will be no other afterlife other than that eternal damnation for those who have rejected him. The Bible said the angel of the Lord will gather the tares, gather the wicked. The Bible said they'll not come willingly. They're going to come wailing, weeping, and gnashing their teeth. God has been keeping books on every living soul since Adam. He's recorded every word, every passion, every motive, every single thought, every action, every deed, the book of life. And on that day, he's going to remember all who are in that book. They shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that served him. If you love Jesus this morning with all your heart, if you're washed in the blood of the Lamb, your name is written in this book of remembrance. God said, I'll mark you in that book. Your name is written in that book. You need not fear this message. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. The wicked, the ungodly, the sinner is judged out of everything that's written in those books. There are those who stand before this judge who neglected their salvation. They're in great shock because they don't believe they should be standing here numbered with transgressors. These are those who will say, well, Lord, I went to church. I paid tithe. Lord, I wasn't bad. I did so many good works. And the answer will be, all your works is filthy rags in my sight. There will be those who say, we've cast out devils. We've healed the sick. We did mighty works in your name. And the Lord says, I don't even know you. You're a worker of iniquity. The angel of the Lord will say, you gave no earnest heed to the things which you heard. You let the word of God slip away from you. How do you hope to escape, seeing that you've neglected so great a salvation, which was so clearly confirmed and revealed to you? This judge is faithful, and he will call his witnesses, and the first witness will be the very word of God itself. The Bible says, he that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that will judge him. The word that I have spoken shall judge him on that last day. The word that I have spoken. Beloved, everyone who stands before the judge must answer for every message they've ever heard, every scripture verse they've ever heard, every song that had a line of scripture in it, every radio program, every television program, every word Jesus said, the word that I have given you, that will judge you on that day. The men of Nineveh, Tyre and Sidon, these cities that were destroyed, they would have repented in sackcloth and ashes if they had a fraction of the warnings that you and I have had. Perhaps the most tragic soul standing before the judge will be those God calls unprofitable servants. These are servants. That means that they call themselves by the name of Jesus. All the multitudes of unprofitable servants. Servants. These are the servants who hide their talents, too lazy to invest their life and time in God's interest. Cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When you stand before the judge, he begins to talk about your lack of interest in his work and your focus on your own life, your own interest, and all the time that you have spent for yourself, even at the neglect of your children. Let me show you what is left. You spent your time and your life 
And I warned you and told you that it's all grass that would burn in a fire. Your heart's not with me. It's never been with me. Long, long ago, you left your first love. You had no place that was not really planted in your heart. I'm not the lover of your soul. Who are those that stand before the judge that are going to have boldness and confidence and joy exceedingly abundant? And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto those on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. The scripture says, And now my little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment. Now test yourself to see if you're going to stand before the judge of all the earth with boldness and confidence and singing in your soul. So teach us to number our days. Teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. This is Moses, the prayer of Moses. He's looking back over all of the troubles of Israel. He's led a people who were greatly blessed of God, who'd seen such miracles, left Egypt with such high hopes, a land awaiting for them that was promised, a land flowing with milk and honey. And he's thinking now of, of all the wrath of God that had fallen upon those people. He's thinking of the people that are being turned away because of their rebellion and stubbornness. For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. Thou carriest them away as with a flood. They're all like sheep. In the morning they're like grass which grows up. And in the morning it flourishes and it groweth up. But in the evening it's cut down and it withers. What's the purpose of their living? What will they here for? What kind of waste is this? And that's when he says, Oh Lord, teach us to number our days. For all flesh is as grass. And the glory of man is as the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower thereof falleth away. The Bible says, Your life, our life is like a vapor that appears and suddenly gone. Are you ready to meet God? Do you know Jesus? The majority of them say, well, I don't want to talk about it. I'm all right in my own way. I've got my own religion. They don't even want to hear. They don't want to talk about it. If there's no eternal value. There's no eternal hope. They're living for this day. They have wasted. Many of them absolutely wasted their time, wasted their days. You know what the Lord is saying to his bride? Get ready, because I'm tearing down all the walls. It's high time to awake. Trim your lamps, get a good supply of oil, and make every day count now. Make every day count because time is short. I don't want to waste any time. And how can I do that? We've been commanded to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Our purpose is not to hold people. Our purpose is to conform you to the image of Jesus and ask you to go into all the world and preach the gospel. But just going to some exotic country or some troubled spot will not give you quality of time in itself. The Bible says many, many will come in the last days saying, Lord, we've done mighty works, cast out devils, healed the sick. But the Lord said, you wasted your life, you wasted your time, I didn't even know you. They were so busy working for Jesus, they didn't take the time to know him. It's not in going someplace or doing something great or special that gives the meaning to your time. Brother, sister, you could read this Bible all day long. If your heart wasn't in it, you're not making your days count. You could pray until you have no more strength left. You could pray for hours and hours and hours and have no meaning to it whatsoever. In fact, it could be an abomination to the Lord because your heart is not in it. The secret of making every day count is to develop a yearning heart for Jesus. 
a heart that pants after the Lord. David said, as the heart of the deer panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. David had a craving for the Lord. Every waking hour, he was longing, yearning, looking, reaching out to the Lord. That's how David made his days count. You know the reality. You're all that I want. You're all that I desire. And every waking hour, hundreds of times a day, your heart magnetically is pulled toward him. And you begin to reach out and long and say, Jesus, you are the one I want. Thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee. Is in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. David said, I pine for you, O Lord. I'm longing for you because nothing satisfies me down here anymore. Now I'll tell you what, the more you start yearning for Jesus, the less this world will attract itself to you. This man leads armies out into battle. This man writes poetry. This man plays instruments. This man is a man of many talents, many interests, very busy man. My heart is with you. He goes about doing the best he can. He's faithful, he's just, he's kind, he does a good day's job, but he's constantly yearning, reaching out to the Lord. That's why God said he's a man after my own heart. That's when he chases me. He's after me night and day. Abraham was a rich man. He'd be a rich man today by our standards. Abraham confessed he was a stranger and a pilgrim on earth looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. And I'm afraid a lot of us are going to miss out because we are not strangers. We are not pilgrims. We have dug down our roots. We're down here now thinking about how we're going to make it better. Folks, why are you digging down when it's all going to burn? Why are we digging? Why are we taking roots? Why can't we live as Abraham with our bags packed? He said, I'm passing through. I'm a stranger down here. I'm an alien. I thank God that my citizenship is in holy Zion. That's going to be my eternal home. That's the city whose building maker is God. Hallelujah. That's a people washed in the blood who have nothing left but a yearning heart for Jesus. Paul said he had a desire to depart and be with God. Why God waits to answer. Isaiah 30. Now wait till you arrive. I hear the rustling of the leaves. It's been said here at Times Square Church, if you don't come with your Bible, you're naked. This is your clothing. Amen. Robed with his word. Verse 15. For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest till ye be saved. In quietness and confidence shall be your strength, and you would not. But you said, no, for we will flee upon horses, therefore shall you flee, and we will ride upon the swift, therefore shall they that pursue you be swift. One thousand shall flee at the rebuke of one, at the rebuke of five shall you flee, till you be left as a beacon upon the top of a mountain, as an ensign on a hill. And therefore will the Lord wait, that he may be gracious unto you, and therefore Will be exalt, he will be exalted, that he may have mercy upon you. For the Lord is a God of judgment. Blessed are they that wait for him. For the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem. Thou shalt weep no more. He will be very gracious unto thee at the voice of thy cry. When he shall hear it, he will answer thee. When he hears your cry, he will answer thee. Hallelujah. We thank you, O God, for your precious word. Your word is our lamp, it's our strength. And I stand as a shepherd of this flock to humble myself before you, Jesus. And I ask for a special touch from heaven, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Let me speak as a shepherd does to his flock. Lord, I'm only one, but I ask you, Lord, to use this vessel this morning. Sanctify me, purge me. Let me speak the pure, holy word that will produce life. Oh, God, we thank you for your presence here this morning. You were here since we opened the service, and you're going to be here all day. Now, Lord, apply the word to our hearts. Holy Spirit, bring forth unction. 
bring forth an anointing. Let the Word heal us this morning. Let the Word strengthen us. Let the Word uh, reprove us and rebuke us if it must, only to heal us, that you may be gracious unto us. I pray, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Why God waits to answer. Now, I've read to you from Isaiah chapter 30. Don't turn there, but it goes back to chapter 29. This is during the reign of Hezekiah in Jerusalem and Judea and in, in Judah. The prophet Isaiah is contemporary at this time along with the prophet Micah. These were the two prophets that spoke during these times. If you want to know how the times were uh, during this period that we're discussing this morning, you read the whole book of Micah and you get the picture of how Jerusalem and Judah are under judgment at this time. And Isaiah is sent by the Spirit of God to Jerusalem and the inhabitants there and God's people. And he's got a two-pronged message. First of all, he warns of a horrible warfare that was coming. And second, there was a promise of God's deliverance that they would simply trust and obey. <clears throat> the prophet Isaiah stands before God's people in Jerusalem and he gives an awesome prophecy. He said, you're going to be going through a great test of faith. And this is all in the 29th chapter, and I'm paraphrasing. He said, there's looming before you a great test of faith. <clears throat> you're going to wake up one day, he said, and look out over the walls of Jerusalem. You're going to see the Assyrian army surrounding you. And he said, within one year, it's going to happen. You see, God always warns his people. He always warns us. And he's, the prophet Isaiah tearfully is standing before the people and they're really being judged at this time for an apostasy. apostasy. In the city of God, the place of his anointing where his fire fell on the altar <clears throat> was going to come under an attack. They would be besieged. And there's going to be such uh, a, a besiegement that there would be towers raised against them where there would be bridges made so that they could... Uh, go from their towers right to the top of the wall. They're going to be battering rams, battering the walls night and day to try to tear down the walls of security. <clears throat> These battering rams were going to be an attempt to crush every protecting wall. They were going to go through the bread of adversity and the water of affliction. They said, the, the prophet said, your trial is going to become so heavy. You're going to be humbled to the very dust. You're going to lay prostrate. And the only strength you're going to have left when this battle is over is just a bare whisper. You're just going to be able to whisper. All your strength is going to be gone. Now, folks, this sounds very familiar to me. It sounds like the same kind of warning the Holy Spirit has given to us in the New Testament. It's a warning that we, as God's people in the last days, are going to go through spiritual warfare. That the devil's going to come and you wake up one day and you're surrounded by enemies. You wake up one day and you find yourself in a battle for your life. You find the devil coming with his battering rams and his towers and bangs and he hits and everything out of hell comes against you. And there are people sitting among us here this morning in the balcony, main floor, around me, surrounding me. And you don't know who they are. I don't know. Only the Holy Ghost does. He's the mind reader. And he knows exactly what you are going through this morning. He knew that all week, and he prepared a message for many of you. Some of you are visitors. God sent you here this morning to deliver you, to bring you into a new realm of discovery in the Spirit. And he's going to help you this morning. If you just say right now, Holy Spirit, open my ears to hear. If you're sitting here this morning and your mind is wondering, bring it to captivity, every thought to the obedience of the Lord Jesus, because the Holy Spirit is faithful to his flock. He is faithful to his people. Folks, we serve a loving Heavenly Father who wants nothing more than to deliver His people. He's called a deliverer. He is a deliverer. And that's what He has in mind for you this morning. Suddenly, some of you have been cast into the trial of your life. You're being tested in your faith. And some of you have been so overwhelmed, you've literally been crushed and humiliated. And you get up each day and you wonder if you can go on. There's a doctor in this church, <clears throat> fine man of God, and just recently he was sued and uh, taking a stand for the Lord and going through it. And he said, Brother Dave, every day I wake up, there's something new 
there's something worse. There's always another evil report. I am being battered. I'm at my wit's end. I got a letter. Uh, you know, we received uh, thousands of letters from our mailing list that our messages are sent all over the United States and around the world. <clears throat> and this week, a letter came to me from a sister in the Midwest, and she said, Dear Brother David, I attend a Holy Ghost-filled church. I've grown more in the past two years than in all my past life. But for the past six months, I've been going through a fiery trial of my faith. And I don't think I can take much more. Why does everything have to be so hard? I have met the devil face to face. And it seems like he hits me in some different way every day. Every day there's another evil report. He's been robbing me financially. He's trying to discourage me so I'll quit. I've become so weary. It shows on my face and now in my attitude. Every day just brings more pressure. Why can't things settle down for a while? I bind Satan. I praise the Lord all times, but it seems to be to no avail. I know the word is true. I'm listening all day to godly tapes, but I can hardly make it through the day anymore. I'm so tired trying to be strong. I'm at my wit's end, and I really don't know what's happening. And we get letters like that from all over the world. People going through the test of their life. The prophet Isaiah sees this uh, <clears throat> message from the Lord. He hears the voice of the Lord. And he said, even though I warned you of what's going through, even though I have warned you, <clears throat> I'm telling you that God, if you'll trust him, is going to bring you through miraculously. God is going to deliver you. You're going to be surrounded by armies. You're going to have battering rams, battering at your walls. You're going to go through such a test that's going to bring you finally prostrate on your face in the dust where you can only whisper, but I'm telling you now, you don't have to do anything about it. You're going to just trust the Lord and he's going to carry you through. And one day in his time, every enemy will be gone and it'll be just like a bad dream that passes away. <clears throat> He gave, in, in chapter 29, there are eight verses. The four first, four first verses of chapter 29 are all woes. What you're going through. Folks, hasn't the Holy Spirit warned us that we're going to be in spiritual battles? Hasn't he warned us that we're going to go into a fiery furnace? He said, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing has happened to you. But he said, what's happening to you is common to all of God's people. But God will in his own time and his way make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Even though he warns us, he said, in the last days we'll be persecuted. We will be tried. And just when you think your strength is going to fail, when you're at your lowest, when all seems hopeless, at the peak of your crisis, the Bible says God will take over. You read 29, Isaiah 29, verses 5 to 8. And oh, what a, what tremendous promises are given here. Moreover, the multitude of thy strangers shall be like small dust. The multitude of the terrible ones. And in fact, in Hebrew, those very important people who come against you shall be as chaff that passeth away. It shall be as an instant, suddenly. Thou shalt be visited of the Lord of hosts with thunder and with earthquake and great noise, with storm and tempest and the flame of devouring fire, and the multitude of those that come against Jerusalem, her aerial, even all that fight against her and her malt and her munitions, and that have distressed her shall be as a dream and a night vision. And here's a wonderful promise. God says, The multitude of your enemies shall become like fine dust. The multitude of the ruthless, like the chaff, shall blow away. The Lord will visit upon your enemies, is what he's saying with thunder, with earthquake, with great noise, with storm and tempest, and a devouring fire. And you know what the prophet is saying? Very suddenly, when you think it's hopeless, when you think you can't go another step, suddenly, suddenly, the Lord shall come with thunder and lightning and earthquake. The Assyrians who have schemed to destroy you will themselves be put to shame. And that's all through chapter 29 and also the first part of chapter 30. He said they're going to wake up into a delusion. They're going to have empty souls. 
The devil's plans and schemes will fade away like a bad dream. God will lift you up out of the pit of despair, and everyone who's come against you, wait, warred against you, shall be consumed with his voice. They will no longer distress you, and the dream will pass, and you will come into his glory, and you will come into the increase of bread, the scripture says. Your bread will be increased. It means the blessing of God. Folks, we today have even greater promises than they had. Scripture makes it very, very clear that we live in a time of greater promises. For he hath obtained a more excellent ministry by how much more he is the mediator of a better covenant which is established upon better promises. We have all the promises Jerusalem had and we have all the promises of the New Testament. Yes, God has warned you. He has warned me. He has warned us all that there are times that come that are going to test the very righteous. And I want to tell you, and I want you to hear me well, the more righteous you are, the closer you walk to Jesus, the hungry you are for him, the more you seek his face, the more you are going to be tried and tempted and tested as no other Christian. Dear sister on our mailing list, this is... uh, Send us these, this note. Dear Brother David, I feel that of the Lord to send you these encouraging words from Brother Frangipani's book, The Three Battlegrounds. And I want to read just a paragraph. And, and here's what it said. In these closing moments of this age, the Lord will have a people whose purpose for living is only to please God with their lives. You know there are people like that. Their only purpose for living is to please God. Do you know the price that kind of person is going to pay? In them, God finds his own reward for creating man. They become his worshipers. Oh, thank God for worshipers. If you are a true worshiper, watch out. They are on earth only to please God, and when he is pleased, they are pleased. The Lord takes them farther and through more pain and more conflicts than other men. Outwardly, these people seem to be smitten of God and afflicted. Yet to God they are his beloved. When they are crushed like the petals of a flower, they exude worship, the fragrance of which is so beautiful and rare that angels weep in quiet at their surrender. One would think that God would protect these who worship. He would guard them in such a way that they would not be marred or broken. Instead, they are marred and broken more than any other men. Indeed, the Lord seems pleased to crush them, putting them to grief, For in the midst of the physical and emotional pain, their loyalty to Jesus Christ grows pure and more perfect. In the face of persecution, their love and worship toward God becomes all-consuming. Folks, that's the purpose of suffering. That's the purpose of being tried, that God may bring us to a place of sweetness, a place of rest, that we can come to this, he said, in and quietness and confidence shall be your security. That you're secure because you have test, you've been tested of the Lord and you didn't murmur, you didn't complain, you didn't quit, but you grew in Christ. It produced the nature of Christ. It produced the beauty of Jesus in you. That's why some of you are going through it. You can't understand it. But Pastor Dave, never have I loved him more. I've studied, I've wept, I've cried, I've prayed. I walked circumspectly before God. Why am I going through the trial that I'm going through? Some of it is financial for some of you. Some of it's children. Some of it's family. Some of it's physical. I don't know what you're going through today. Is it your father, your mother, your brother, your sister, your your children? Is it just your own physical pain? What is it you're going through? I don't know, but he does. But he said that's common. That is not to be considered something unusual. And if God doesn't deliver you immediately, I can tell you one thing. He'll give you all the grace you need to see it through. There was a persistent woman who cried night and day for justice and a vengeance. She kept coming to the judge. And the judge said, because she bothers me, I'll answer. But the Lord Jesus himself, and shall not God avenge or protect his own elect, which cry unto him night and day, though he... Bear along with them. I tell you, and this is Jesus speaking. Jesus, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. 
Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. God said, make sure you understand that the Lord will fight your battles. The Lord will do it. Now, beloved, Jesus was the fulfillment given to all the prophets of the promise. You read about the promise all through the Old Testament. That was Jesus. That was the Messiah coming. It was given to all the prophets. I want you to go to Luke, please, the first chapter of Luke. I'll read something to give you great encouragement. It's one of my favorite passages of Scripture. Luke 1, beginning to read verse 68. You should read this every week or every time you're downcast. Luke, the first chapter. Chapter, beginning read, uh, verse 68. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. This is <clears throat> Zechariah speaking. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Who is that power of salvation, that horn? Jesus Christ, our Lord. Hallelujah. As he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from what? Our enemies and from the hand of how many? All that hate us to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he sware to our father Abraham, that he would grant unto us that we being what? Delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him. How long? All the days of our life without fear. All the days of our life, God dealing with your enemies in, in your household, your enemies on the job, your enemies on the street, demonic powers, principalities and powers of darkness, whatever it may be that comes against you, the Lord says, I will deliver you from all your enemies so that you live out all your days in peace and rest in the Lord. I want you to go to Isaiah, back to Isaiah 30. The 30th chapter of Isaiah again. You see, God comes to Jerusalem with these wonderful promises. He said, if you'll call on me, I'll hear you. You'll hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it, when you turn to the right or to the left. He said, if you'll simply call on me, I will hear you, and I will answer you. And he said, I will deliver you, and I'll handle all your enemies. <clears throat> but the scripture makes it clear that Israel, or rather that Jerusalem and Judah, did not listen to the prophet, did not listen to the word of God. And the scripture says they panicked, and they did not consult the Lord, but they had their own committee meetings. They met in private, and they said, who sees it? God doesn't see it. And they counseled among themselves, and they did not call on the name of the Lord. They didn't seek the guidance of the Holy Spirit, but they turned to the arm of the flesh. They got on swift horses and sent ambassadors to Egypt. They went to Zoar and, and, and to Haines. And they sent their ambassadors on swift horses. And they turned to the arm of the flesh. Look at chapter 30, verse 15, if you will, please. Woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord. And their works are in the dark. And they say, who seeth us and who knoweth us? Chapter 30. <clears throat> uh, no, that, that's uh, chapter 29, 13. I want you to... Uh, Go to chapter 30, verse 15 again. This is chapter 30, verse 15. For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest shall ye be saved, in quietness and confidence shall be your strength, and you would not. Now, folks, look at me, please. This is the prophet Isaiah standing before the people. He said the Assyrians are coming within a year. And he said, all you have to do is stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. All you do is cry out to the Lord, and he will come and deliver you. And while they're gathering around you, while all this turmoil is around you, you're going to have your mind at rest and peace, and that's going to be your strength. 
That's going to see you through if you'll just take my word. But he said, you would not. You would not listen to that. You wouldn't take it. They panicked. And they said, no, we want to see action. The Lord works too slow. Oh, isn't that just the way we are? God has made us great and precious promises whereby we're made partakers of his divine nature. You know the hardest thing it is for a Christian or a child of God to do is to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. We want something to happen. So we get on our swift horses just like Israel and we run down to Egypt. Egypt is flesh. Egypt is man-made methods. You see, the Bible says that the Holy Ghost is our comforter. And rather, and rather than accept that and rest in that, we run to our friends. We get on the telephone. We look for some human comforter. Who do you run to in your brattle? Who do you go to? Who hears your ear? Do you run to the Lord or do you immediately pick up your phone? You say, I've got a good friend. This friend has to, this friend will help me out. The Bible says Jesus is our healer. And rather than rest on that, we run to our doctors, we run to our hospitals, we run to our experts. We really don't trust the Lord. You and I know that. When we are in battle, when we're in trouble, we run to some counselor, we run. We have, we have Christians now that just go to the Christian bookstore. Look at all the people lined up on the how-to books. How to find happiness, how to solve your loneliness problem. There must be 10,000 books on how to, to overcome loneliness, written by lonely people who don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> they're trying to solve their own problems. God said, if you will seek me, your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk ye in it when you turn to the right hand and turn to the left. All God said, Israel, or Judah, Jerusalem, Judah, will you just lean on me? Folks, I'm telling you, we don't do that. Somehow this has to get into your heart. I've stood in this platform, in this pulpit, this past year especially, I've been looking back over the messages I've preached and the notes. Folks, I have preached more on this subject than any other subject this past year. Brother Carter has stood here and others have stood here trying to get us to believe God, not to lean on the arm of the flesh and to rest in his promises. It has been coming at us time and time again. And God must know, he must know, and I know he does, that many of us have been grieving him because I can preach the kind of message I'm preaching this morning about distrusting his word and leaning not on the flesh, but leaning on his word and his promises. And people will come up and say, brother, that was a good word. I can meet him out on the street. Boy, that was good. Boy, the Lord touched me. That's Sunday by Wednesday. The trial was raging around them and you thought I hadn't said a word about trust. Everything they heard Sunday morning or Sunday night, they have forgotten. And they're on the telephone, they're in panic, they're on their swift horses running to Egypt. And I'm telling you, that wounded the heart of God. God was wounded, he's grieved. Because rather than being in a secret closet pouring out their hearts, they're down sitting in the council rooms with the Egyptians who were heathen, worshipping idols. And they're pouring out their heart to these Egyptian lords. These very Egyptian lords that God once wounded and destroyed the posterity of these people. And here they are with their seed sitting down in these council rooms saying, look, the Assyrians are coming against us. We're going to be in the battle of our life. We are weak. We can't stand it. We will pay any price if you'll come and protect us. What does, how does the heart of God feel when his own children having all these promises turn away from him and run on swift horses to the camp of the Egyptians and they're unburdening and unbosoming themselves to these men. And God said, it's a shame. He said, they can't help you. And the prophet is incredulous. He can't believe their blindness. He said, you've, you've lost your discernment. Woe to the rebellious children that go down to Egypt. And if not, ask at my mouth. And they go to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh. 
and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. And the prophet comes along and he said, you know why you don't hear the word of God? For the Lord's poured out upon you a spirit of deep sleep and he's closed your eyes. You so many times trying, every battle has been a test. He's tested you and tested you, failed and you failed and you failed. And here they are at an ultimate test. Folks, I want to tell you something. If you've never heard anything ever preached in this pulpit before, listen now. Listen to a pastor who's learning. I'm sorry I had to wait till I'm this age, in my 60s, to learn some of these lessons. But you can preach this gospel all your life. You can talk about faith. You can preach it. You can preach about trusting the Lord. But I want to tell you, it only comes through trials. It only comes through tests. And I wish I had learned in some of the former tests that I wouldn't have to be tested so severely at this time in my ministry and my age that I would have to go through such, such severe testing till I finally learned this lesson to just step back and trust God and call on His name and let Him take care of everything. I have learned in a time of slander and abuse to stand still and see the salvation of God and not try to defend myself for the house of God. I used to be a fighter. There was a time 10 years ago before I came to New York. You ever touched me? You came near me. You pick yourself up off the street. Bless God, I'm a prophet. I didn't say that, but I felt it. You touch me and you're dead. No, folks, that's all gone. And you know why? Because in the test, you're not to retaliate. You're not to take the battle in your own hands. You don't sit around questioning, is God doing this or the devil doing this? It don't matter. If he's chastening you, he said, blessed are you, whom the Lord loves. You say, well, God, you must love me an awful lot to test me like this. But some of you are not there yet. You're still fighting. Somebody talks about you on the job. Start a rumor. You go start another one. You're going to retaliate. You're going to get even. That's not the Christ way. The test you're going through. Are you going to sit around? When, when do you stop complaining and say, oh God, where are you? Why are you doing this to me? Lord, I've never loved you more than I do. Why, 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 why? That's the only word some of us get out of our trials. And the hardest thing to do, and I'm telling you this, and it's the only way, is to rest and stand still and say, God, teach me the lessons I want to learn. Open my mind. Open my heart. There's so much that he wants to teach us. You say, well, Brother Dave, I've been walking with God for 30 years. Well, folks, I've been walking with God longer than that. And as a pastor, I'm still learning. You're going to learn too. Forget how long you've been walking with God. I know people walk with God 50 years and they're still babies. They've learned hardly anything. And they don't understand why the Lord keeps testing and trying them. Hallelujah. God was greatly offended when they panicked and rushed down to Egypt. God calls it outright rebellion when we refuse to, when we refuse to rest on His promises. Woe to the rebellious children that take counsel but not of me. They've not asked at my mouth. They depend on horses and they trust in chariots because there are many, but they look not unto the Holy One of Israel, neither do they seek the Lord. Beloved, all through the Word, we have been warned that we're going to go through this and that God tells us that if you're a true worshiper, you're going to be tried more than anything else. 
But the truth is, the majority of God's people do not rest on the promises. They don't. Now, God saw this feverish activity going on. He saw them rushing down to Egypt. Can you see? Their ambassadors and their princes, they've got swift horses, and they're all excited they're going to work out their own problem. Go ahead, get on your swift horse. The Bible said the horses that are following you are just the swift. And you can't outrun your problems. There's no place on earth you can outrun what you're going through. Wherever you go, it's still there. Because the horses, the Bible said, that are after you are swift as your horses. Just about you think, oh, that's all over you. Turn around. There it is. Still following you. No, you can't outrun your problems. And you, and, and these men panic. They're trying to outrun their problem. Look now with me. I, and here's the heart of my message. Verse 18, chapter 30. God looks down. At it, and he says, and therefore will the Lord wait, that he may be gracious unto you. I'll wait. Look at me, please. God says, okay, you don't need me right now because you're so busy doing it yourself. I'm just going to wait. I want to be gracious. I want to hear you. I'm ready. I, I have a plan. I'll do it my time and way. I'm testing you to see if you just sit and wait and rest. Get off your horse. But he said, and this is the reason why God has not answered many of you. Because you're still so busy trying to work it out. Figure it out. And Lord said, okay, I'm going to wait till you exhaust all your human effort. I'm going to wait until you completely are exhausted and say, well, to whom shall I go? That's where he wants you. Where you are hopeless in the flesh. There's no man. There's no woman. There's no program. There's nothing on the face of the earth is going to help you. And you say, all right, God, I quit. I resign. You do it. You do it. <clears throat> David said, I cried unto the Lord with my voice. And my voice unto the Lord did I make my supplication. I poured out my sorrow before him. I showed before him my trouble. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then thou knewest my path. God said, come on to me now and pour out your soul. Tell me what you've tried. I understand. I've followed you. I've watched you. The Lord said, wait. I'll wait till you're exhausted. I'll wait till you're tired of trying to figure it out. And you just, you just fall back and say, God, it's absolutely beyond me. I can't fight it. I can't do anything about it. I can't change it. I can't, my finances, my family, Lord, it's there. It's been thrust upon me. I have to just endure it. But oh God, you're going to have to give me strength. You have to figure this whole thing out. And the Lord said, Let, let's, let's go on. Hallelujah. He said, I'm going to wipe away your tears in the next verse. For the people that dwell in Zion at Jerusalem, thou shalt weep no more. For he will be very gracious <laughs> unto you. Uh, he will be very gracious unto thee at what? The voice of thy cry. And when he shall hear it, he will answer thee. First mess, uh, uh, it was the second message I heard Pastor Carter preach. When a cry becomes a prayer, is that it? And that's when I got on my car phone and called him to come down here and preach, which led to his being here. And I know he preaches this, and I know how diligently I preach it. But folks, somehow, by the Holy Spirit, it has to find its mark today and change us as a people. God cannot build a strong church on people who are not convinced that God is on their side, that God sees and knows all, and that he alone, by faith, to those who call and cry to his name. Folks, I don't do anything anymore. Anything that comes my way, you know where I go? I don't get on the phone. <clears throat> I don't call Pastor Carter. 
I don't call any pastor anywhere on the face of the earth. I don't even sit down and talk over with my wife. I love her, but I, I don't take my problems to her. <clears throat> my wife, I love her. She, she can't touch that space in me. She can't help me there. She can't heal me. We can encourage one another, but it doesn't touch that spot. And so I go into my study and I shut the door. Or I go out, get in my car and go to Pennsylvania and go up on a mountain. And I'll spend three or four hours just walking and crying my heart out. I unburden my whole soul. I tell him everything. I weep, I cry, and I say, God, you said, and I use this very verse, you said when I cry, you'll hear me and you'll deliver me. And I'll tell you after, when I come out, when I come out of that secret closet or when I come away from that walk with God, <clears throat> there's something inside of me that can settle on this in quietness and confidence is your strength. There is strength that comes. God reassures you. Then you're not looking to the arm of flesh. You don't have to call anybody. You don't have to talk it over with anybody. That doesn't mean you're a law to yourself or that you're just a loner. But then when you come out, you're talking faith. You're talking God's on the throne. You're not trying to figure anything out. But folks, God has waited and waited sometimes on me. And He's going to stand by and wait. You can, you, you can, you can pray for eight hours a day. You can seek God with all, all that you are in the flesh. You can read chapter after chapter after chapter. You can read whole books. You read the whole Bible. But if you don't have faith, in His promises, in His Word, nothing's going to happen. For the Egyptian shall help in vain and to no purpose. And they shall be to you a shame and a reproach. You turn to the flesh, it ends in nothing but shame and reproach. But oh, I love this. He will be very, not just gracious, but very gracious to you at the voice of your cry and when he hears it, he will answer thee. All right, before I close, now go to chapter uh, chapter 30, verse 20 and 21. And the, the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction. How many of you are going through that right now? Bread of affliction, water of trouble? Where's your hand? Am I preaching to myself? I said, how many of you being tested and tried? Raise your hand. Quit hiding. Well, there's still some of you hiding. <laughs> I'll tell you what, if this, doesn't, if this doesn't apply to you today, get the tape by Wednesday it will. <laughs> Verse 20, and though the Lord give you the bread of adversity, who gives it to you? The bread of adversity, the water of affliction. Yet shall not thy teachers be removed into a corner any more, but then I shall see thy teachers. And folks, you know what this is? This is revelation. This is, who, who is our teacher? The Holy Spirit. These are revelations of the Holy Spirit. It never it won't be hidden to you anymore because you're trusting in the Lord. They're going to be revelations of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's going to guide you now. He's going to lead you through. He's going to tell you how and what to do. Sometimes you just say, stand still, don't do anything. And then he will give you direction. There'll be a revelation of who God is, who Jesus is. And you'll be standing there, but you won't be standing still. You'll be learning. There'll be a process of learning. Your teacher will not be hidden anymore. Nothing will be hidden from your eyes. You'll be learning. Verse 21. And thine ears shall hear word behind thee saying, This is the way walk ye in it when ye turn to the right hand. And when you turn to the left, he said, I'm going to make your path clear to you. You're going to know and understand. And folks, I don't have time. You go through the rest of the chapter and it's all about how God's going to bless you and prosper you in the, in the spirit of Christ and the glory of God, how he's going to lead you and give you the bread of increase. Hallelujah. He's on the throne. He's not going to fail. Some of you need a baptism of faith this morning. You need to quit figuring things out. Some of you haven't slept good for a long time. God wants to give you a Holy Ghost sleeping pill today. <laughs> that you can go to bed tonight and rest and say, Lord... You take it from here. 
Will you stand, please? Now, beloved, look my way. I've been in the ministry long enough to understand that God doesn't speak like this unless he has reason. He knows what he's doing. The Holy Ghost knows what he's doing. If I'm convinced of anything, it's that. And he's trying to accomplish something in your heart. First of all, I want you to know if you're going to seek God with all your heart, you've got today to settle this matter. You're going to be tempted. You're going to be tried. You're going to be tested. You're going to be persecuted. How many understand that now? The closer you get to God, the more fierce it can get. I tell you what, though, the Lord won't keep you in that condition. He comes to deliver. But do you understand now the reason why he waits to answer? He's waiting for you to quit figuring it out. He wants you to quit running around trying to solve your own problem. He wants you to just give him simple childlike faith and say, Jesus, everything I'm in right now is beyond me. <clears throat> and I know some of you need strength. It's not that you doubt the Lord. It's not that you uh, have any intention of ever leaving or wounding him. But in the flesh, you're weak. Some of you only been saved a year or two, maybe. You don't understand it may be that everything's going well, but something inside. The enemy comes at your faith. He comes at you. He comes at your family. He comes with worry. He comes with fear. And those are the battering rams of the enemy. Fear, guilt, condemnation, and so many things. He just batters and batters and batters. What are you going to do? Are you going to panic? Or are you going to stand on his word? He said, I'll make a way of escape. I will. I'll keep you from falling, and I'll present you faultless before his throne with exceeding joy. I will, I will, I will. And that's what faith rests on. Oh, God, you do it. I'm telling you, I stand here now because he's brought me out. He has delivered. He brought me into his banqueting house and his banner over me is love. Hallelujah. God wants to bring everybody in this church this morning out of your pit of despair. He wants you to walk out of here with a song in your heart, joy in your step, having committed everything to him, casting all your care upon him because he cares for you. I want, first of all, the first invitation up the balcony here on the main floor, those first that are going through a severe attack. You'd have to say, I'm like the children of Israel. The enemy has surrounded me. The battering rams are on me. And I, I have just been tried and tested as never before in my life. I'm really going through it, Pastor Dave. I want you to get out of your seat first. Balcony, go to either uh, side of the stairs and come down any aisle. I want to pray that God this morning give you a great victory. That he'll lift this burden from your heart today. <clears throat> if you're backslidden, if you're not right with Jesus, come and follow these that are coming. Say, I, I, need, I need to come back to my first love for Jesus. Maybe you've never been right with God. Come and make it right right now. God will deliver you. Please move close. And move in close because there will be a lot of people coming. All right? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You that are standing here, that came forward, Holy Spirit just spoke something in my heart. I don't think we realize how serious and how, uh, what a storm some of you are going through. I'm going to ask a question I feel the Holy Spirit to ask. And this is not to be showy or anything else, but to show how serious it is for some of you. How many of you have gone through it so badly lately? The enemies even whispered to your heart, there's no purpose in living. 
you might as well take your life. Raise your hand, please. Raise it high. That's what I thought. That's why the Holy Spirit laid it in my heart. Have you been coming here for how long? Nine months? God's going to give you a great deliverance this morning. That will never come again. Isn't the Lord wonderful that He knows what you're going through and He prepares a precious word just to lift you out of that. It reminds you how much He cares. Huh? Isn't that wonderful? Now I'm going to come against these lying spirits. I'm going to speak the word of faith. I'm one of his shepherds. He's anointed me for this. And I want you to know, I, I want you to believe the Lord, but I want you to believe with me that as I pray, God's going to break the hold of this lying spirit that's trying to bring you down. The devil only holds you through lies. Once the lie is broken, once it's exposed, he has no power, he has no authority. <clears throat> Hallelujah. I want you to just lift both hands. You don't have to weigh up. Just, just, that's, Lord, I surrender. Father, in Jesus' name, I come against every principality and power of darkness. I'm asking you, Father, to bind and rebuke every lying spirit, every lying spirit that has come against the children of God and those who have been cold and backslidden, those who are going through trials and temptations. You're the great deliverer, and I speak the word of faith right now that you break these chains. Every demon power, you're commanded to depart in Jesus' name and go your way into the abyss. Go your way. Break these chains, Father, by your Holy Spirit. Break this chains. Break the power of these lies. As we begin to praise you, come now, Holy Ghost. Encourage, a spirit of encouragement to place the lying spirits, to replace the spirit of the devil, the spirit of God, and the spirit of encouragement. Now just tell him you love him right now. Worship him and let the spirit of God come upon you. Holy Spirit, fall upon this church because we trust in the living word of God. Lord, we have taken your authority now over all principalities and powers of darkness, the lying spirits of hell that would deceive. And I speak against every thought of suicide that is here this morning, that those thoughts never return. Not one shall be lost to this demon of, of suicide, this demonic influence. In Jesus' name, I bind that spirit. I bind it in Jesus' name. And that spirit is bound. And you're commanded to never return to harass these minds again. Put a wall of fire now, Lord, around about and be the protection of these, your children. Hallelujah. I want everybody in this church, I'm going to sing that again. Whom shall I fear? You have, we have no one to fear. <laughs> 